my whole process has been one step at a time. Uh, my like one of my goals in life is just balance and everything in moderation. And then I would say another thing is just like finding joy and happiness in the journey and the process. Um, I think if if you're missing that part, you know, no goal is is really worth it if if the day to day is so you know if you can't find the joy and the happiness in that because I think when you it doesn't matter you know you you win a medal you win a tournament you know that last you know just for like a little bit. Um, but everything that you built and you put into that, you know, that's, those are the defining moments. That's what kind of made you that player that was capable of winning something, winning that title. Um, so I think it's really important to be proud of the process and proud of the journey and what you do it like day in and day out, the little stuff, because that's what makes you, you know, a champion at the end of the day, when you're able to use those skills to showcase it and actually win something. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Better at Beach Volleyball podcast, where all we talk about and all we discuss is ways to get better at the game uh, and in the end, just become a better human, a better person. And so if you're looking for volleyball tips, tricks, and uh, knowledge from pros and coaches, this is the place to be. Today on our video slash podcast, uh, we have Sarah Skirmerhorn, AVP, FIVB Pro. She's got a medal under her belt and she's got a high of a second, which is a life dream of a finish for 99.9999% of everyone out there. And I'm, I'm sure she is ready to get her first this year. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have her on. She's helped us with our camps in Florida when we run our Better at Beach Volleyball camps, the seven-day training vacations, and the reviews from our players were just that she was crazy fantastic as a person and a coach. So uh, without further ado, Sarah, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. Hey, thanks, Mark. Appreciate you having me on. I'm excited to uh, chat some volleyball stuff with you. Heck yeah. Uh, yeah. You are partnering now with uh, Corinne Quagle, and you are on your way to Doha in a wee bit. Uh, but what yep. was your day like today? Like if we were just diving in right into the life of, of Sarah, what was your day today. like today? What did you do? Today. So we had an 8 a.m. practice this morning. So we were up, quick little breakfast um, on the court at 7.30 setting up. Our coach is currently in Brazil right now. Mm-hmm. So we bring our that? speaker, uh, Victor okay. Gomez, Victor Gomez. So he's he's coached me for the past, God, ever since I started, he was one of my first coaches. Um, but he's currently in Brazil and with COVID, he was able to kind of go online and be like an online coach. So we go down, we set up, he sends us a Zoom link we set up our cameras and he's able to be live with us at practice. Um, I think I saw Corinne in Florida actually doing one of those sessions last time I was there. She just had the camera set up a little like kind of speaker Bluetooth attached to it. And it's so cool. I mean, maybe we could get into that later, but the idea that you can set up a camera, you can coach literally like you can do online coaching live. uh, And, you know, we do, a version of that, not not quite as in detail as you guys do, where we're actually right. at the practices, but it's possible for a coach to be there no matter where they are in the world and see what you're doing, guide your practice and, and start noticing things. So what's yeah. that experience like? Yeah, it's been really cool. So I guess at the start of COVID, we, Vic, Victor was back in Brazil and, you know, we had some, well, there was definitely a learning curve, I would say, um, but he's been doing it for about two years now. And, um, you know, he's got his two camera angles that he likes to have. Um, and it's pretty cool because he can set up in his room and uh, he's got, you know, two monitors. He can sit there with a notepad and take stats and he can give, you know, just direct feedback back to us. Um, so it's awesome. been pretty, pretty incredible. Yeah. And he's, I mean, he's, he's a really special coach. coach so um, he's got lots of good tidbits that he throws in. Um, what do you think his best his best asset as a coach. Like if you were to say like, this is the one thing that I appreciate Victor the most for. Mm, that's He's got a lot of good ones, but I would say the best thing that he's good at is kind of incorporating the mental training into practices. Oh. Like a lot of coaches talk about it or the of the game is so important. Um, but he brings in kind of different techniques um, that consciously, you know, our practices are more, I guess like, you know, frontal lobe conscious thinking um, so that when we kind of get into the match situation, um, you know, we're operating 
a little bit more uh, smoothly and just kind of in his, in his own. Now, is he guiding you uh, in terms of, hey, this is how you focus? Hey, this is how you problem solve? Or this is how you communicate? Like, which type of mental coaching uh, is the... He kind of touches on all of those. Okay. Yeah. Um, cool. And a lot, you know, a lot of what we practice is, you know, it's, it's, it's working on ourselves. It's working on, you know, how we handle our emotions, how we deal with certain situations. Obviously, you've got you know, volleyball is a very intimate sport with your partner. Um, mm. So how you communicate with your partner is very important. But I, it, it's it's nice. I feel like um, Corinne, Victor, and I, we all kind of, you know, understand, you know, where he's coming from. Um, not to say everything's perfect and everybody gets along 100% all the time, but just having that understanding. If everybody's and that pushing fact, to, to go yeah. forward. Like there's no <laughs> way you get along if everybody's trying to be their best, you know. Right. But it's just that trust in the process and trust in each other and knowing that, you know, if we follow the process and, you know, it'll all come together. Okay. So uh, you guys are kind of working through the, the relationships. It seems, I don't know, you know, social media is interesting, weird, fun. It seems yeah. like you and Corinne just get along. We've, we've spent a lot of time together since we've partnered up. Um, hmm. Me being in Florida, her being in California. Um, we've just kind of made it work where we're, you know, we're practicing together a lot. I think my husband has seen Corinne about every time that he's seen me. Wow. <laughs> Just because, you know, um, but it's, it's all good. Yeah. We, um, we get on, she it kind of feels like a sister. It's kind of just like she fits right in to That's the family. Awesome. Um, her, her parents are awesome. Her mom plays pickleball. My mom plays tennis and pickleball. Um, she's got two siblings. She's a middle child. I have two siblings. I'm a middle child. Not awesome. that those are like, you know, but yeah, um, but you got stuff to talk about right away. Yeah, yeah. You know, and you can um, nod your head and be like, uh -huh. <laughs> Yeah. Both of both of our dads are like big big speakers. Uh you know, they they're like, well, Corinne's dad does uh speaking for a living. Um that's awesome. and my dad was in sales, so same thing. So that's um, speaking for a living, yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. So um but Man, yeah, I no, want to I take mean, some just... school from from both of your dads. Like public speaking is something that I really want to get into. Um and then sales is something that I have no idea how to do. A, but we have a company. So there you go. I'm just yeah. like, you know what? I'm just going to talk to people and uh, maybe that'll <laughs> tell people to come to our camps and courses. Yeah. No, I feel like you're doing a pretty good job, Mark. Oh, thanks. Uh, yeah. Getting there. Maybe we'll see, but I would love to take some lessons for, from your dad who well, either... uh, owns a company called beach bub. Beach bub. Mm -hmm. Tell Stands me about for... just briefly. Tell me about beach bub and what it is and how people can get one. Beach Bub stands for Beach Umbrella Base. Um, so we just shortened it and turned it into an acronym. Mm -hmm. um, but it started as just a base um, to hold an umbrella from flying away, you know, on a windy day or, or just on a normal day. Um, but it started from the base and it's kind of taken off. Um, the base was really stable. We had like a lot of people in the, in the early days came back and said, you know, the base is awesome. Where can we get a good umbrella that matches the quality um, mm -hmm. of the base? So my dad was going out and he tells the story so much better than I do, but it also takes him 30 minutes to tell it sometimes because he's got all the, all the details. But anyway, <laughs> lots he basically of went out, <laughs> lots of hook points. He basically went out, developed a whole umbrella, a whole system. He's taken like, you know, goes after one point after another, but all the little weak parts of an umbrella, um, he's just mm -hmm. really, you know, made better, made, made more sturdy. But the whole concept is it's, it's very similar to a patio umbrella. Um, where you have a weighted base. It's usually plastic filled with water. Mm. And my dad was sitting on the beach one day and saw an umbrella pick up, go down the beach and hit someone. He's like, what makes a patio umbrella work so well? And he's like, it's weighted. And he's like, well, we're sitting on the beach and we all have all this sand that is, that's heavy. How can we use this to make a base? So basically the, the, the base itself is very light. The umbrella is very light and portable, um, but it's just a triangular tarp your umbrella goes down through, um, there's a hole in the middle just to kind of stabilize the umbrella. You fill it with sand, it holds 120 pounds of sand and your umbrella is, it's all connected to the pole. So you're pretty much, you're, you're set for the day. All your weight's Perfect there. The when you're beach. done, you unhook it, you unload your sand, you walk off with your 10 pound little umbrella. That's great. But, all right. and but we you can had get it on a, Amazon. A, oh yeah, you can get on, on Amazon too? Yeah, Amazon and, and their website, Beach Bub, but, um, and you'll see them out at the AVP um, cool. in the players' boxes and and around. But um, 
But yeah. Awesome. Nice to have I a little family a biz that, that supports the VB game. And yeah, you got it's a, a nice built-in mesh. sponsor, which is uh, I know. always nice. Yeah, you can uh, go and uh, submit your expense report for Beach Bub. <laughs> I will. I tax, will. Yep. Tax fee travel and tournament <laughs> fees. I like that. Exactly. Oh. Um, so, Sarah, uh, let's uh, dive back into the, your path through volleyball yep. and then beach volleyball. So when and why did you start playing indoor and, and or beach were you a beacher beach. first or indoor first uh definitely indoor first i grew up in north carolina um my whole family plays tennis and uh my brother's really good at tennis at so Elon university of, is that right yeah so he played at nc state for a year or two and then transferred okay. to elon kind of the same time that i went in on my recruiting call oh, nice. so there's a little there's a little bit of like who committed first but i think it was me and then he just went there the year before i did but yes, he went, we went to the same school. Yeah. Everybody played tennis. He was really, you know, good. It was his thing. I think I wanted my own thing. Mm. Um, so I was kind of like, oh, tennis practice. I don't know. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to go. So I was like, well, if you're not going to do tennis, you know, got to do something else. So yeah, there were volleyball tryouts. Swing. <laughs> yeah. So I um, tried out for volleyball and loved it. It was kind of a nice little mesh, uh, you know, had aspects of tennis the overhead, yes. you know, the overhead serve, the, the arm swing stays aspects. and you know, you could pick up I, I, a number of athletes have come from tennis and you're just like, I'll put you on a volleyball court and the, the serve. And yeah. just like, at least when they hop and spike, it's just so natural immediately just because you have that constant overhead high motion already right. built in. So right. I, the tennis was my first sport. And, okay. I didn't uh, know that. Yeah, I got that like my the stupid slice serve that puts uh-huh. s- some people in trouble, and that's that's all my second serve. Like all my serves yeah. come from some version of tennis. Okay, and then so so you went there for indoor. So I went there for indoor, and it was actually so I went there from 2007 to 2010. But there were two years that we did a SoCon beach tournament. Hmm. Um, this was before beach volleyball was like, I guess they were they were talking about it like my freshman soft oh we might make this a an ncaa sport so we did like it was in the spring everybody you know from the socon went to like their rec courts and their indoor coach you know just everybody just went out for like a week and kind of like learn the rules like you're not allowed to tip you know that's about you Brutal. can't you can't you know set with or receive what you know the very 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 basic rules i um, literally almost got in a fist fight my first beach volleyball tournament me and my brother had both played indoor and they kept uh-huh. calling us for doubles and we had played indoor and we know that that's like not a double in indoor. And right. we thought that because we were the new guys, like they were messing with us or stealing points from us. So we like got in their face. Yeah. And then one of the, <laughs> like a little old, like 55 year old man was like, guys, guys, it's, it's, I think there's something you're not understanding. There are actual different rules right. from the two sports. And right. we're like, huh? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we had to calm ourselves down a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it was definitely yeah. I I don't I don't know that there. I hope there aren't that many videos from from that tournament. Or it would be funny to go oh, back and man, watch. That would be awesome. You should do yeah. a reaction video on YouTube and just uh, you know reacts to her first ever beach volleyball game. That would be great. Yeah, I don't know if there's video, but if they're entertaining for sure. But yeah, so that was kind of my first experience, and that even more so was like a good combination between tennis and indoor volleyball. And I was like. Mm-hmm okay this is this is really the sport this is like the golden sport i would love to play this At was it because time, it was like more freedom of movement so um I was you a, know like you had to cover a middle more? Okay. i was a middle so like as a middle you're not really in control of the game you know you're kind of reacting you could go in play the whole front row maybe like you know block fake whatever you may not even get set you may not touch the ball and you come out yep so beach volleyball it's like you know it's it's a little yeah, more yeah yeah i get to play i have to play <laughs> and you know i and i like that about tennis where you kind of have to um you know you're the only one on the court there are no subs you got to figure it out you know if something's not going your way you got to figure out how to change it as quick as you can right um so i like that aspect of beach volleyball um kind of you know played some local tournaments but then went overseas and played three years of indoor volleyball denmark and um, france Denmark and France. Nope. Two okay. years in France. One we were in neighbors. Denmark. I played in Sweden. Maybe we were there a little you while. You played in Sweden? Sweden and Norway, yeah. Yeah. It's cold up there. 
it I was don't like the cold, but it was different. But I was kind of envious of of Denmark. I I, I don't know. It, I, awesome. I think Scandinavia is awesome. Uh, I yes. don't like how expensive everything is. Um, I thought the people were just fantastic for whatever I reason. Agree. The the language was kind of easy to pick up. Uh, Danish, I can imagine it being so hard because you're like gargling everything. Or hurrah, yeah. hurrah, hurrah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but but Swedish and Norwegian, I was I was able to at least be conversational. Yeah. Which is, that's kind of the coolest I, part. The Americans who go over and they don't learn any part of the language. I'm like, what are you doing? I, I, I learned a little, I learned like a couple words, but everybody, everybody in Denmark, even like the older generations, they all spoke English so well. It so was a well. very easy stepping stone into like living in Europe. Yeah. Yeah. They use words like uh, remarkable and, and, so, and you're like, <laughs> why do you know that word? <laughs> Okay, so you're playing indoor, um, and then uh, it, when, when does beach come along? So, yeah, so I finished indoor, I guess, in 2014, and decided I was just, you know, I didn't want to do it forever. I kind of, like, had the experience that I wanted, came back, was living in North Carolina, was helping my brother with his real estate investment company. Um, and there's a local club called Beach South up there. Um, I don't know if you know. Do you know Scott? Have you ever? No, Scott, Scott Cass Stevens. Yes. Cass Stevens. Yeah. I do, yeah. So, yeah. So Beach South is his club, but he, um, he was like, Hey, if you want to coach, you know, we'd love to have you, whatever. So I was, you know, getting more involved in, you know, the training and, and, and beach volleyball up there. Mm. Um, and it was actually Scott, we were going down to Florida to play a tournament. Um, and he was like, well, it's women's open the first day. If you want to come, I can set you up with a partner you can play and then we'll coach the next day. And I was like, okay, it's kind of been a minute since I played because in North Carolina, you know, you're not like training back then. You're not really like training yeah. year round. Yeah. Still. Um, so <laughs> Kaylee, Kaylee Melville um, had just graduated from Stetson. She had played indoor and he was like, you know, she needs a partner, blah, 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 blah. I was like, okay. Mm -hmm. This girl's like training and playing all the time. Sure. I'll go, I'll go pop in with her. Um, but yeah, we ended up, I think we took second. I think we played, I want to say we played Kim Hildreth and Kaya in the wow. finals. But that it was, was a good, first... I mean, it was like, open level beach tournament Pro i mean aside from like a wilmington or oh screw you that yeah. that's your first experience i got my ass kicked in a and double a <laughs> for a while <laughs> jesus okay but you go know, on mel's, mel's, mel's a great <laughs> defender we had i mean we just had a lot of fun and so um the rest of that year she was playing nvl but she mm -hmm. would come up and play a lot of the local stuff with me uh yeah. her parents lived in north carolina so we just you know scooted around and just played a bunch of tournaments did really well and she was like, you should just come to Florida and train with me for like a little bit. And yeah, she was pretty convincing and she basically got me to move there. That's awesome. Um, and I ended up staying with her roommate from college who I had never met. And we ended up living with them for two years. And she's one of my like great, awesome friends that, you know, to this day, we're still great friends. She's about to graduate, uh, get her nurse practitioner oh, wow. uh, degree uh, this weekend. She's an so, awesome but person. yeah, I mean, it's, it's, well, not Mel, but the girl that she hooked me up with. Oh, okay. Well, I still think Mel's an awesome person. So. Yeah, Mel is still awesome. I'm sure this other cat's um, cool too. <laughs> she's cool. So, but yeah, so that's kind of how it all started. And then, uh, do you know Raquel Ferreira? Yeah. Yep. So Raquel and Victor were kind of like my first coaches down there. The first season, Kim, Kim was playing with Raquel and I was playing with Mel. And it was, that was kind of our training group down there. Nice. Um, it's a it's a small group, you know. You gotta have those small, tight groups in, in Florida because there's yeah. not. While the high level is still the highest level, like competitively across the country, there's yeah. only like a maximum of six people there. So it's probably you're training against the same people all the time if you want quality competition. Whereas once you come out to California, it's like which of this thirty person list should I call to see if they're available right. for practice? Right. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. It was, it was interesting. It was, um, I guess it was, I kind of like practiced and developed in a very different, you know, place. And the, 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 Cal the California, I feel like everybody, you know, they switch their training group up a lot. They're always training with different teams. Um, it was kind of nice in Florida where we had, there were other times where Victor would coach us and he would bring his Brazilian team up. So yeah. we, it was like kind of the two of us going back and forth. They weren't really our direct competition. Um, but he could kind of dive into a lot of stuff, you know, as like a foursome of like what we were working on. We could kind of be on like the same 
same path and um i don't know i think that's really... what's missing from pro in california you know usa volleyball has done a lot with their with like their a teams now where mm -hmm. they've got four teams uh that they'll invest in and they'll they'll bring all the coaches there but they didn't do it long enough they didn't do it early enough and there's there's still not the pipeline that gets yeah. uh the like at least uh, from the men's side there to say we are all working on this together and going right. forward and all of the pros it's so what's the word it's cannibalistic almost yeah. because you want to train against other people but you don't want to train against them too often because you right. think you want to diversify your enemies so that you can um become equipped to battle a different person and you also don't want them to learn your game too well and you're also right. always seeing like if you could train against the next highest like better team instead of it, dude yeah it's about you right you know it's not about them like how good can you get can you keep your focus and i think california misses that because of how many good players we have here it's yep. almost a bad situation well and and i just so much of what i liked about it was like we kind of went in and we're, we're building on our own program we have our own routine um you know when you go practice with another team it's like okay who's whose coach is running the practice mm -hmm. you don't necessarily you know sometimes they're like well what do you want to work on and it's just i don't know you you, you lose a little bit of like the but on like just plan like where your coach is like this is how we're building you like from this part of the season to here and right. it's very very progressive and you know you've got those stepping stones and it's week in week out i mean it's it's nice for sure to to compete against different teams um but i don't i don't necessarily think you need it every day or not I, even every week i have a theory that like uh, american volleyball for beach would improve if you developed like three team clubs in the AVP, okay. you know, instead of everybody always going against each other. So those three, you know, you practice together, you develop a plan, you set yourself forth, and then it's actually affordable instead of two people trying to pay one full-time coach. Now you've got six people paying a full-time coach so that, that coach actually like they can survive. They can give you the time uh, to go into film with you, to go into your lifting right. program, to go into this. But when two people are outside the top three rankings, uh -huh. they cannot afford a full-time coach, you right. know, and, and we lose because of that. And then only USA volleyball only supports, you know, the stipend for the top like three teams. Um, Ish, give or yeah. take give or take yeah yeah so i you know I, yeah. I think there's still something left to be desired for for what usa is allowing for where the level can get for americans and i think it, ncaa on the women's side has taken care of that yeah uh, where and you guys are gonna so... kick an ass globally but guys yeah, I, I think, that's... think... Mm. yeah yeah but that is what all about the college college game is that you 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 have that camaraderie and everybody is kind of working together and so what if you know like this person's strengths or weaknesses or whatever? again like you said it comes back to like you how you're going to perform um you know you you know some tendencies or whatever but it's it's basically you know you managing your own game over here yeah. um but it's nice it's nice to see the camaraderie it's nice to see you know more than just like two people cheering cheering for themselves yeah right yeah yeah and a lot of times uh, in in our world it becomes one person cheering for yourself and just wondering if your partner is going to leave that yeah you know, <laughs> and who who he or she is texting you know uh, after yeah, a rough practice true. so let's just go back to uh, kind of your career mm -hmm. do you think that there were any to be to be to have a to get to a final in avp is unbelievable to get a medal in yeah. fivb is unbelievable now is do you think that there was a significant exact point that you go this was the most crucial time in my volleyball career. Like, was it Kaylee um, who just like brought you to the sand? Was it Scott inviting you to coach sand? Uh, or or was it before that, you know, during indoor? Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of think like the moment where I was like, okay, beach volleyball is is something that I could do was when we played those SOCON tournaments. Mm. Um, how old were you and then? That, how old was I? One, 19? 19 or 20. Oh, wow. Okay. So, all right. So in college, you were still like a in college. Up on the beach and indoor. Okay. That was like my first ever experience with like playing beach was, was that SoCon beach tournament. And I was a sophomore. So what are you as a sophomore? 19, 19 or 20. And I don't know. I just think I, I kind of always kept an open mind um, mm. that if an opportunity kind of present itself that I, you know, and it was, 
and it made sense or it was the right timing that I would, you know, pursue it a little bit. So um, I just, I think I've just been very, you know, just an open book kind of, um, like I think when Ron Victor were my coaches, which I think I was very spoiled to have such high caliber coaches when I was, you know, just entering that we're able In to kind small of small environment. Oh yeah, I know. I know. So, I mean, I think, I think things just kind of like fell in place, but at the same time, I think I just was, you know, just trying to be a sponge and absorb as much as I could with an open mind and just take it one step at a time. And I was like, okay, well, if this makes sense, you know, I don't think I moved to Florida to be like, Hey, I'm, I'm going for like going to be an FIVB, you know, AVP pro. Just want to play um, some volleyball. I just want to play some volleyball and learn and see if that's something that, you know, I'm capable of doing. And, yeah. um, that's just kind of been my, my mindset from the, from the get go, like kind of still is my mindset. I think it's just, it's literally one day at a time, um, see what opportunities, you know, present themselves and make the most of them. You know, it's cool to hear that, like the, the root of it came from, and, and I've been big on this lately, a community developers, people who put on tournaments, who put on leagues, who just start classes locally, uh, mm -hmm. who run, you know, for us, like we run our, our volleyball vacations. It, but to say that that the availability of playing on the sand for you mm -hmm. may have created, you know, a major, a major chapter in your life and, and what gives you so much enjoyment just because, you know, somebody who was putting on a tournament, you know, putting, putting right. on a league. I think those people are underappreciated. Um, guys like Rich Hylas uh, and and Wayne Gant from from Great American Volleyball, and anybody mm -hmm. who's got like two courts outside of a bar and decides to just at least create a list and a bracket for a tournament, like right? Yeah, you're a community yeah. organizer. You've grown something, and some kid, somebody might find their future here. And I think that's true. Sure. I haven't actually ever thought about that. I don't know who actually ever was, you know, the minds behind putting, you know, running that for two years, but. I, I do owe them a great thanks. So whoever that was. <laughs> we'll, we'll find them. Guys, comment. We need to find them, yeah. Who, who was running? What was it, Con, SoCon? So the SoCon was, um, it had like Elon Furman, UNCG, uh, God, who else? Walford. There, you know, there were just a couple. Brandon Fuller was playing at UNCG at the time. Hmm. So, and she, so she had some beach experience. And then there was a girl on my team from Orange County, California. So there were like two or three players in there that like, knew you know we're a little more familiar with beach volleyball for sure and then the rest of us were just you know playing indoor on the sand yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's sometimes it's not a bad way to go i think more people yeah. can bring their indoor game better to sand um just learn how to rip fingertips off when you need to you know when you're yeah. in trouble like that's that's a that's a nice little move but yeah. uh indoor sand so what do you think in terms of becoming a beach volleyball player what do you think are the two most important attributes they can be mental or physical but the two most important attributes of a successful player i go to the mental side of things um i would say for for me um one of the big ones is like finding the positive in a situation it mm. kind of goes hand, hand in hand with um like being comfortable being uncomfortable uh because I just think there's so much, there's so much that can go wrong. There's, you know, you, you, you've got waves and ups and ups and downs all the time. And it's such a fast sport um, that if you can just, so I always... you can, if you, I'm just saying, if you can focus on the positives um, and, and pull those out of every situation, um, then you just, you keep building on those and you kind of stay in that, stay in that headspace. So I think that's just an important co like way of keeping a good mindset as you're, I, uh, I hold people apparently on this show to giving actual direct examples because that's that that whole thing of like being mentally strong turn positive turn negatives into positive. Right. Um, it, what was another one that we had recently? Uh, mentally tough, uh, emotional intelligence. Like these right. are words that I say. Guest, I apologize, but you're gonna have to dive a little deeper and give me a direct example. A direct. Of okay. what you mean um, when you say turn something positive or be comfortable being uncomfortable. Uh, well, positive one for me is just the way you kind of communicate on the court. I'm communicating to my partner and I'm like, we want, I want to change the strategy. Okay. And or I'm, or I'm really frustrated with maybe something my partner's doing and maybe she's hitting line and they're just digging, digging her line. So 
I could kind of go two ways. I could be like, stop, stop shooting the line. Like they're there, whatever. Or I can give her a little bit more positive thing and say, Hey, she's running to the line a lot. You know, the cuts open, like the deep, hard swing middle. Like instead of just saying this is what you don't have or putting the attention on what's not going well, why not give some positive feedback? That's, I just, I just think that the brain does what, what you tell it to do. If you say, don't think of an elephant, yeah, an elephant. But if you direct somebody and you say, Hey, think of uh, Steph Curry twirling a ball on his finger. Whatever you say is what people are going to think. Whether you put the, the do or the don't in front of it doesn't really matter to our brain, I don't think. So, you know, just always trying to communicate in a way that's like what we want to happen, what I want to happen. And to my partner, and I think, you know, just that kind of that understanding, I think that's a big, big part on the court. So, you know, whether it's communicating or whether I'm, you know, self-talk to myself, the same, same sort of thing. You know, if I just pass the ball tight, what's the point in saying, God, that was too tight? When just say, hey, I'm going to just, hey, I'm going to pass this ball a little that's bit farther perfect. off next time. I, and I think that... When you're talking, the communication when you're saying like, "Hey, don't hit line anymore," that's that doesn't give good instruction. You know, people want to no. learn what's available, what they can right. do. They don't want to. Nobody wants to hear what they can't do. Well, people also you're leaving that. so many options open. Like I can hit the ball on the court over there. Mm-hmm. I can I can shoot. I can swing. I can tool off the block. Like. Yeah, I've, I've unlimited mm-hmm. options of what what I now okay. I've eliminated one option, so I can't shoot the line. Yeah. What like okay? So now what am I supposed to do? Right. Like let's let's hey let's hit two cut shots right now just to hold her so that we have that line at the end of the match. You know, right. like little kind of maybe tricky, but uh, a yeah. little bit more positive way of putting it. And me, me and Chad, Chad's uh, hanging out here as well. Um, we we're talking yesterday about I know. Mm-hmm. When somebody says, when, when somebody says, Hey, hit that cut shot. And, and she says, I know, or she says, Oh yeah, I know. Uh, I'll do right. that. You know, like there's a, such a different tone between tone when you huge. say, I know, or like, yeah, I know, I know. Okay. It, it, and it'll be received a different way. It'll create a whole different vibe between you and your partners. But For that, sure. that statement of, I know, oof, that is a quick way to never get feedback from your partner ever again. And then you're That's, not sharing yep. information and you're done. Right. You know, yep. the, the way you say, I know, I think is, the is very The way crucial. you say, I know. Yeah. <laughs> well, and it's, it's kind of like, I mean, just touching on communication again, I feel like even when you, you know, are, are calling a shot or maybe, you know, you're in service Eve and you're calling, you know, mine and yours. Um, well, let's just go back to the shot. You know, you can, you can be telling your partner like line, 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 or you could be like, line line you know Mm -hmm. and like sometimes if you just you know the way you say something you can really like make your partner you know act in a different way um yeah but it's it's all it's all you know seems like little nuances but they're all i think very important things to pay attention to and you know practice it's important to practice you know how you're communicating with your partner how your tone affects your partner you know maybe maybe something too aggressive Make sure you just swing 110%, and that's not that's not necessarily good either. Um, mm-hmm. So right. I, I think, you don't want to get I them too mad because maybe they're terrible when they're aggressive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they're just important things to you know think about, and and you know practice isn't just you know this the skill and like you know the touching of the ball all the time. There's there's a lot more that goes into it. We um just like a little kind of side note for a little tool that we have that we use while we're talking about it. Uh, we have a a thing on Better at Beach dot com and. I, I think you should try it. Uh, it's called betterbeach.com forward slash partner profile. What it does is it, huh? it makes you answer certain questions about yourself. And really, I stole half of the answers and just converted them from uh, a marriage counseling book. You know, I, I read a few books like on marriage and relationships before I got married. I was like, I'm going into this for the rest of my life. You better damn well know I'm going to research it and be good at yeah. it. You know? <laughs> I'm not going to be crap on marriage on day one. Like, let's go. Um, yeah. So I went to the marriage gym and uh, <laughs> got my one rep max up. But we developed – It's if you guys are looking for it, it's called betteratbeach.com forward slash partner profile. And it forces you to answer questions about yourself that you probably don't think about. Like – uh, for you, Sarah, what's the number one way to fire you up? What are just give me like five words or a sentence that you know excite you or put you in a good mood? That put me in a good mood. Um, I don't. I mean, I would say I'm just gonna touch because I'm in this partnership right now with Corinne. I just 
I feel like we just say things that like make each other like giggle. I know that sounds silly, but like we just like laugh a lot back and forth. Mm. Um, and it's just it's nice to go into a match um, or you know a practice just kind of in a, a like a good mood. Right. Um, doesn't matter what's happening. You know, we can like we can make jokes, but then I feel like we both um, can kind of go get into that zone. But mm-hmm. I think first and foremost, we just we want to we want to go out and have fun and like ha- like enjoy what we're doing. Like we get this opportunity to play beach volleyball, so I think it's just like all right, here's another here's another opportunity. I'm excited. I'm happy to play this sport. I'm going to go out here and have fun and enjoy what I'm doing. Um, and it's just I mean I think both of us are kind of in that same place. So I mean, that honestly, just like going out there and be like, okay, let's like, we're just going to have fun. Let's, you know, do what we, we, we've trained this. We know what we need to do. It's literally get to go out here and enjoy what we've, what we've worked so hard to do. Let's just go enjoy. Um, Is there a wrong time to try to make you giggle? Like if you, if you just got blocked three or four times in a row, am, am um, I, am I supposed to tell you a joke as your partner or tickle you? <laughs> I'm not gonna it's, gotta, it's, it's, it's gotta be the right uh yeah um again those are like the nuances you kind of have to like understand with your partner because they're definitely i think i think talk about not uh, you know understand is tough to tell people like you have to know when nobody knows when you want something in your head emotionally you know and that's like so if if it's not the time to laugh anymore when right you're, you're, when you're being pushed around on the court Somebody has to know that. Right. Um, you haven't really, I haven't quite run into that. Um, mm. um, You've just never been stopped. In, I get it. Yeah. In this, no, <laughs> in this partnership, I haven't really, I haven't really run into that. There, I mean, but there are definitely times in the past where, where you're like, God, yeah, I, I know what you mean. Hmm. I know what you mean. Tough. It's, that's a tough, it's a tough Sounds like you don't meet. have an answer. Oh, you got some little. Yeah, I, I don't have, I know, have a great. I know. <laughs> um yeah well what's the best thing to tell you so this is like the next question like uh, and you know, if again guys if you want to uh, check out this we're not putting sarah on the hot spot for more than one more question but uh, <laughs> if you do want to check it out for you and your partner it's super valuable just better at beach.com forward slash partner profile and there's a bunch of leading questions to discover what your game is about and what your emotional mindset is about so you can share that with your partner and then both get a feed so it sounds like the answer that one of the questions on the profile says, what's the best way to start your engines? And for you, it sounds like having a good time. Get me laughing, get me in a positive mood. Whereas, you know, some guys might be like, punch me in the chest 13 times right. and that'll you know, make <laughs> me like want to kill somebody and that's how I play well. Um, so what would be a turn off for you? What is the absolute wrong word or trigger if you're you know, for your partner to tell you after you got blocked or dug three times in a row? Um, like kind of going back to like, you know, the neg, like, like you, we can't do this anymore or that's uh, not working or, you know, just, um, it's just something that's like open-ended where you didn't really offer a solution there. You just kind of reinforced that. Yeah. That I, I can see that's not working. Like that's, that doesn't really, that doesn't really help me if you tell me that's not working. I, I <laughs> thank you. Don't like, I'm not. Wow. I'm I not forgot done. we lost that point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Like, so I think that I, up. I think I'm a smart person. I think I can analyze and realize that, yeah, it's not successful. Um, so yeah, I think I think just something that we're kind of like undermines or questions like your, you know, your your intelligence or your mm. capabilities on the court. You know, mm. maybe. Um, so again, that kind of goes back to just really trusting your partner, uh, trusting that you, you know, I, I know what they're capable of. They know what I'm capable of and speaking to each other and communicating in a way that's, you know, like if they make a joke or something, it's like, it's not that like, I don't think you're, you're not capable or it's kind of maybe like, oh shoot, that was just a really good block. And maybe that's why we yeah. laugh, not like a dumb move on your part or, you know, it, it, it's, 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 it's tricky. Um, mm. And they're just those little nuances and connotations and just the way you communicate. So would a um, safe default for you be keep ripping? You got this. Yeah, exactly. Just keep it positive. Okay. Yeah. Give me, um, give me, and you give don't me want the... somebody to try to find a solution, like to tell you a certain hit uh, at that point or what's open or to tell you to breathe or to give you like technical feedback. Uh, last bit would be like, okay, the, so the safe default is to tell you to do something positive, but uh, yeah. y- you don't want technical feedback 
when you're in trouble? Uh, it could be it could be technical if it's like um you know like maybe someone if it's like a do by... instead of a don't do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. like they're they're swinging line. If 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 someone's you know kind of beating me on the line, it's like I, you know they they keep going line. Maybe just that you know that one more step and really like seal that line. Like you got it. Just you know reach that hand line. Um, okay. So it could be it could be okay. I could so take you have it just... if instead of um do this or don't do this is right. the best way just, maybe to I'm not, I'm not a big fan of the don't do this. Okay. That's a big, yeah, that's a big turnoff to me. I think, I think for a lot of people that is, yeah. uh, you know, uh, and, and people go through it constantly and they're just like, all right, well, what, what am I going to do then? You know? And, and right. again, the, the going back to like that one thing where it's don't tell me what I can't do now. Now I'm going to try to prove you wrong. Exactly. Unless it kind of gets you, you in know that your mindset. partner so well that like you love like the uh the triborn, where it's like tell me I can't, you right. know. <laughs> right. Yeah. But that belongs to come from somebody else, maybe not your partner. But if yeah. you know that that person next to you loves the challenge, like you won't hit over him right now. I bet you can't hit over him straight down, you know, just to right. try to get him to reach higher. Yeah. It's yeah. Gonna, it so different, fun. but that's still got like playful, positive connotation. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So it, knowing, knowing what words set you off, knowing what reactions set you off, if, if you don't know them as a player, you have right. to learn them. If you as a coach don't know them for each individual player, you're not being a coach. Yeah. Um, especially long-term, like short-term. Okay. You know, you only got so, so much time, but through a season, if you don't know that when you say, Hey, you're being really lazy right now, that, that for me, that's my trigger. If a coach right. calls me lazy, like that's the literally the one thing in my life that I've prided myself on never being my entire life. Like I right. will always work. Uh, if you, as soon as you call me lazy, I don't have respect for you as a coach anymore because I know right. that you're blind, you know? Right. Um, right. So that's, right. that's my like, trigger word for sure. Right. Anything that kind of like puts in doubt, like who you are as a person. Mm. Um, yeah. It gets a real, it's, it's a turnoff. It's like, okay, you, maybe you don't really know me. And then, yeah, it's hard. It's hard. And then trust is broken. Then trust you know? is, yeah, exactly, exactly. Cool. Okay, uh, we'll get you off the hot seat. But if anybody else uh, okay. wants the, the, the partner profile, uh, betteratbeach.com forward slash partner profile. Really cool thing to go through to just discover some things about yourself. There are some questions that like like you saw here that they're going to take you a little bit of time to think about. And you're probably going to have to think about like what partners pissed you off the most in your life, your career, and what exactly they said and when they said it during that time, just to figure it out so that you could at least warn the next partner of the baggage <laughs> that you carry. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, all right. So coming as a middle, let's go back to the, yeah. the indoor to beach transition. And, and maybe yeah. this is just current, but what do you think, what skill or technique has been the hardest for you to learn or master um, along um, your journey? What's the most painful? Yeah, I would. Okay. So I, I mean, just initially, my when I when I first kind of started training in Florida with Raquel and Victor, um, footwork as a blocker was just so different. Because as a middle, it was just very much like turn and go, like you know, read where the set's going, turn, run, get there, close the block. Mm -hmm. So the whole concept of like little adjustment steps and kind of staying, you know, facing the net the whole time and lining up with the block. There were times I remember working on that for months where it was like you know I'd up and I thought I did a good job and then my coach was like all right what was wrong I was like the lineup I guess question, I don't know was perfect, I was like right? <laughs> <laughs> I was like was the lineup not good I don't was it not was it not there and they were like you yeah, know so I mean just that concept I think um was 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 different and footwork was I remember we worked a lot on just like footwork along like along the net um and kind of I mean you, just have, you have a little bit more you have that time to kind of like front somebody and kind of you know jump and, and and go as a middle you're just literally like as soon as you land you're just trying to close the block so that that was that was definitely a skill that we worked on a lot um so pulling. if you could dive into shuffle like the shuffle and adjustment steps for those people who are uh, a six six b player you know right what do you mean by adjustment steps as a blocker so i think i think for me um like again when you're when at least when i block it then i know kind of have one foot forward um, because oh, really? again, okay. you're, you're ready to pull. So as I, you know, if I'm moving to the, we'll just say this side, then I have this foot forward a little bit and I'm kind of leading, you know, with this foot. Okay. So and if you're I, on the if, left side of the court, your left foot would be forward. If you're on the right side of the court, your right foot would be yeah, forward. If I'm moving. Yeah. My okay. kind of my leaf, my leaf foot 
is always a little bit forward. Um, and then if I, you know, if I decide I want to block, then I, I kind of close that other step in and go block. Or, you know, if you're ready to pull, then you kind of drop that foot back. Um, but you're kind of a little bit like weighted, you know, on that, on that lead foot a little bit. Um, whereas I think, you know, indoor, it's just, it's so explosive and so quick. You don't have that time where you're, you know, you can take that little adjustment step. Uh, but yeah, they're, they're a little bit small and just kind of like going with that lead foot. And that just takes me into pulling as well. Like as a middle, you don't ever pull. So what is pulling? <laughs> that's, that's been fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It can be. Pulling is um, a, another level of adding to your game. I think for Alex Kleinman, like when she added that to her game, then right. it was, then it was pretty much over. Uh, yeah. Her ability to, she didn't have that her first, I guess, year and a half on tour and then she just started peeling a lot more consistently and and picking people up easily with her hands defense i think hands defense is so important for women yeah and it's interesting because i think that they're less likely to as they're coming up through the game to want to use it because yeah. of the strict calling with carries hard driven balls um, yeah. you know, women have like less upper body strength, so you can have a, a B woman player and a B guys player, and there can be a, a B level guy player who can mash a ball, but right. you don't really see that out of like a B level woman. And so you can't, you, you don't get the practice at the lower levels of using your hands. Right. Right. No, that's true. For sure. Do, do you, I have a, a side question, but, um, okay. I know my answer to this, but why do you how do you explain the difference between guy blocking and, and girl blocking when most women, I would say, start in the stagger step, like you're saying, with one foot back, yep. and all men start straight up, squared up to the net? Why is there a difference there? Straight up and squared up. Yeah. Um, I don't, the guys hit a lot. The guy's net is a little bit higher. Um, so, I mean, I think shots have a little bit, you've got a little bit more time to run things down. Maybe the defenders, mm. I don't think the guys pull as much. Mm. I don't think they pull as much. Um, yeah. so I think, I don't know, there are a lot of guys that kind of go real, real deep and they just try to get up and go really high. I mean, everyone's jumping so high. I think you, they just get up really just want to press and take away that hard driven ball. I think guys swing more than girls. I think so. Yeah, I, yeah. I would agree with that. And I think from a guy's standpoint, you know, it, there are dudes that can still from 12 feet off hammer and right. just like uh, still take your defender's head off. Um, and there's just that, that less likely that guys are going to peel and uh, maybe guys should peel more. Yeah. I, I don't know, but, uh, but they definitely don't. And there's definitely a power difference, you know, between yeah. the two games. Um, but it's, it's always interesting to see like uh, women always start with the one foot off the net and, does that mess with the lineups? Does that make the lineups better? Or does it just leave more access to peeling, which is more likely to happen in the women's game? Yeah. It's always intriguing to me to see the guys completely squared up, feet next to each other, and women always in the like ready to run stance. A little, a little bit of stagger. Yeah. No. Yeah. Something to look at. And, and I would, I, I really want to do that, just that full study of let's take the next AVP tournament and just count the number of peels on the women's side and number of peels on the men's side. And That'd be a good step. At least have that. Yeah. Stat. Yeah. What's stopping okay. you? What's holding you back? It's coming up somebody. one week. <laughs> yeah. um, okay. So, so the shuffle steps and the lineups for blocking were probably, yep. you think the hardest, most like pain in the butt thing for you to learn. Was there a, um, yeah, something that made it easy or was it just having the coach discuss uh, it? I with just, you? I mean, I just, I just think we, I, I, I think the whole like first month or two that I was down there, I don't even think we hit the ball. I think it was a lot of like very basic fundamental technique um, stuff. So it was just really take our time and build, build from the bottom up. Like there's no, no point in going like live if you don't have those fundamentals. Um, and that was, you know, they made it very clear that, you know, there's no point in me teaching or talking about part D or C or, you know, whatever, if you're still here in A. So um, it was just very much a building, building process. Um, but yeah, setting was also a fun one too. Are you a hand setter or yeah. a bump setter currently? Bump, bump setter, I, I break out the hands occasionally. Mm -hmm. um, but I think um, just the whole concept of like spacing when you're when you're setting um, and really like lifting and using your legs was yeah. was interesting. But again, I kind of jumped into a group that was beach for a while. So for me, it was really nice to be able to go through like setting rotations 
again, both the girls I played with were defenders. So I didn't really have that on the blocking side, but definitely on the setting side, you know, just to go through setting rotations where I could watch them Mm -hmm. do something. And then, and then I got to go do it. I just think visualization is huge. And I was like, okay, I could just see their, see their movements and, and, you know, try to mimic it. Um, What did you mean when you said spacing? Uh, If you're kind of describing this to a B or an A player, how do you space yourself as a setter? Um, Well, yeah. So spacing and squaring to the net, I I guess would be two. They kind of go together. Um, But I think a lot of times we tend to run to the ball and then try to contact it. Um, But when we're setting, you know, we want to be able to move through the ball. So it's kind of, you know, as your partner setting, you kind of want to move to a spot that's, I don't know, two feet behind the ball so that you have space there to have your platform and then move through through the ball because that's you know you get to your your partner reads so much from your body on how you're setting so it gives you room to to actually square and be facing and they can kind of read the ball off your arm off your body where you're not turning um you're very much just square with with the ball in front of you and then you just move through it Um, and when when you say square uh and for for a lot of us Maybe this just comes from a personal point. Uh, somebody told me square up, I think maybe for two years, and I had no idea what square actually meant. I right. just heard it and I was like, kind of assumed. But it, you mean face with your chest, toes, knees, hips, shoulders, shoulders where yeah. you want to set? Correct. Okay. And where do you teach your players, if you were coaching yourself or, or some other place, where do you teach them to square up to? Are you an antenna person? Are you a you know, face the sideline or are you to where you want to set? Um, I would say I'm more to where you, where I want to set. Um, I, and again, if it's kind of, again, it just, it kind of depends on where you are on the court. So I would to where you're going to set. Um, the only time when you're not, well, and I guess you are, you know, going to square where you're set, but wait, if you've got a really tight ball, um, that was again, another big thing that I worked on. You know, if you're, maybe eight to 10 feet off the net or seven to 10 feet off the net in that range, you're going to be facing the net a little bit more with your shoulders to set an up and down ball versus when you go inside anywhere from like tight on the net to kind of about seven feet, Mm -hmm. I would say it's kind of when, at least for me, when I turn completely and I'm facing the sideline of the court. Um, So it's that, that's a big ball that is, is passed kind of on the seven to eight foot line is a tricky, a tricky ball. You're like, do I go ahead and, and, and turn all the way? Or am I still facing and I just have to have my arms higher so that that ball kind of goes straight up? Yeah. Um, but no, I just heard a few different methods on, yeah. you know, like uh, pre with, with optimum. She, uh, she was always preaching. Uh, I, I hear her say it says peak pole set hold or peak pole lift hold um, uh-huh. where she says like square up to the antenna every time. To me, I think that's a, just a simplification where it gets you in the right area of lined up. And it's a nice key because it gives you something physical that you can make your body go to. Right. Um, more specifically, I ask my players, I say square up to exactly where you want to set. Often yeah. where you want to set is on the way to the antenna. So that works out consistently. It really does. Right. Um, and having a physical object that you need to point your belly button to is right. is a really nice key for people to have. But I right. still think of it like kind of NBA. If, you, if you're, shooting in the nba you know you pull up you face the basket and you release it's not like you're going to like face sideways from the three-point line and throw it off of your shoulder unless you're in trouble right so in terms of accuracy i think it's just where do you want the ball to go that's where you line up but that's just our school but and i think the biggest the biggest thing to take away from that is wherever you line up just set the ball there Mm. because that's going to be the easiest thing for your partner to read um a certain way and then you're shoveling like you said you know, if you're at the three point line and you shoot a ball this way, you know, one, you're not going to be very accurate, consistent. Um, and no one's going to know what you're doing, which you want your partner, you want your partner in this case to know what you're doing. Yeah. Um, because they're the one that's going to be hitting what's coming off your arms. So there, when we're hitting, we can be a little more discreet, but when we're setting, we want to be very readable. I think. I agree. Yeah. And people don't realize how they throw off their hitters timing by different speed of touches, different speed of leg lift, different speed of platform lift. Um, Contact where you contact the ball, whether you contact it high or low. Right. Um, And then the little, the fun stuff when you get to that next level of 
how can I control time by sinking and getting low before the touch or right. accelerating the play and, and setting from a higher, faster point? That's when yep. it gets, you get into the weeds and it's tough to explain that to a B player. Uh, but that's when it, it gets is real fun. Yeah. And it's, it's tough. It's tough to train it too sometimes because it's so picky. It's like, well, that set, I mean, again, looks perfect. Like it hit the right spot. It went to the right height, whatever. But, you know, if you contact it lower versus, you know, higher and it's going to the same spot, you're giving more time in there. And that is going to be different for your, for your hitter approaching the ball. Like if they're, if they're coming all the way from the end line and they're running towards the ball, if I can contact that ball lower, I can still kind of give my partner a low set. It doesn't have to be super high, but I can give her time with a low set versus giving time with a super sky high ball. Yeah. And it's like, you know, there's, we talk about rhythm so much. People talk about rhythm. That is so hard to define it the is. rhythm of a set. But if you imagine that however you look when you set, somebody should be able over time to predict at what point in your set the ball is going to come off and what speed it's going to come off of so that they can almost like dance with you. Or, or you know, we, we call it like jumping into a double dutch, you know, yeah. like – it, you have to time it and the timing of the double Dutch person, the people who's holding the ropes, that has to be consistent so that you know when you can jump in. And for setters, if you jerk when you set, if you like make a fast movement or the next time you make a really slow movement, or sometimes you have super fast hands or sometimes you have super slow hands, you're changing the speed of those ropes. And then whoever's trying to get into your double Dutch or trying to tango with you, they, they don't know when they should get in that dance. Yep, for sure. It's a tricky thing. Tricky. Tricky. Dance, it's tough. It's tough, yeah. (laughs) Not for Chad. (laughs) Chad Chad gave a big cough back here. "Mm -mm." (laughs) We've been we've been reeling. Uh we're gonna we're gonna throw a few more reels coming out here. We're very excited about our real game. Yeah. You'll see. It's the next hot thing to hit Instagram. (laughs) Yeah, okay. I'll I'll be on the lookout. (laughs) I love Uh, a good reel. So Sarah, do you have any warnings for people who are trying to get to the position you uh, are in or like if you looked at you know sarah from the last 10 years ago anything yeah. that you would say hey just don't fall into this don't do this or this is going to be rough um i you know for me again i've just my whole process has been one step at a time uh my like one of my in life is just balance and everything in moderation and then i would say another thing is just like finding joy and happiness in the journey and the process um i think if if you're missing that part, you know, no goal is, is really worth it. If, if the day to day is so, you know, if you can't find the joy and the happiness in that, because I think when you, it doesn't matter, you know, you, you win a medal, you win a tournament, you know, that last, you know, just for like a little bit. Um, but everything that you built and you put into that, you know, that's, those are the defining moments. That's what kind of made you that player that was capable of winning something, winning that title. Um, so I think it's really important to be proud of the process and proud of, the journey, what you do it like day in and day out, the little stuff, because that's what makes you, you know, a champion at the end of the day, when you're able to use those skills to showcase it and actually win something. So I, I think winning the actual medal or the trophy, you know, it's great and it's, it's fun, but, but ultimately it's, you know, it's the journey, it's the process and you've got to learn from that day in and day out and you've got to enjoy it. So um, do you have any, that's my focus uh, little places where you go, things you say or activities that you do at the, the days or times when it becomes consistently unenjoyable. For me, it's always a big, long trip to another country or a camping site. Like once I can get into nature and be completely alone and do li- like literally days of writing, I usually come back to those refreshed. But do you have anything uh, where it wasn't going well for it long enough and you took a breather or a method to say, how do I enjoy this again? Yeah. I think, I think for me, family is just huge. Um, my sister just had, uh, she just had her second kid. Yeah. I have two little, two little nephews. Yeah. And they're, they're great. I've been with my husband. We've been together for 15 or 16 years. Awesome. Um, but yeah, I mean, they're, they're, I've, I mean, I just have a really great support system. Um, I still, I, I work with my brother. I'm really close with, you know, my parents and, um, they've just, they've kind of been a guy, um, my dad, you know, kind of coaches in tennis, but he really understands like the mental part of sports, you know, mm-hmm. whether or not he, I mean, he's just, he's able to coach. It doesn't really matter what the sport is. I feel like he could be on the sideline and, and kind of coach anybody. 
just because it's less about the skill about your mindset and your composure on the court, how you handle yourself, how you deal with the loss, how you deal with the win. Um, so I just, I don't know, having, having that really solid sports system and, and I've had really awesome coaches um, that kind of mimic and, and have some of the same components that, you know, my dad was able to teach from a young age. So um, I, yeah, for me, family, family's huge. Just being able to spend some quality time with them. So is that like you just go and you're but... just like, you know what, I'm exhausted. Um, and you don't use them, but you say like, Hey family, you want to have a barbecue day or a lake day or a boat day? Is, is it something like that? Or are you just yeah. like a call and a text and you just you know, know that sometimes, they've got your back? Yeah. Sometimes it's just a, it's, it's a phone call. Um, my, I've, I've had lots and lots of phone calls with, with my dad. Um, they turn into like hour long phone calls, but he just constantly surprises me with, you know, different sports analogies and stories that he's had you know, from sales, whatever, there are other stories, um, but he's just got a whole wealth of knowledge. I should be writing when he talks to me, I should just be writing this stuff down because he's told me so many cool stories um, in this part, this chapter of my life that, you know, maybe he didn't even tell me when I was playing tennis and indoor volleyball, a lot of really cool stories and information and advice from him over the last couple of years. That's been, it's been really cool. And he's, you know, they're so, they're very supportive of, of my journey and what I'm doing. So that's, that's definitely helpful. You know, if you don't have that, then I, I think it would definitely be easier to fall out, you know, when you go through, mm. go through rough times. So, um, yeah. Sounds family like you're friends. dealt a nice hand in the uh, family department. It sounds like you're playing. Yeah. It right. Yeah. I was. All right. Uh, well, Hey, our last, uh, last two questions, uh, before we let you run back to your volleyball life is, uh, okay. are there any tools <laughs> or equipment? that are must haves for you at home in the gym on the court or on the road like physical physical tools and, and um, like your favorite bracelet or uh you know, <laughs> my, um, I, I don't know actually one of my one of my favorite tools as of recently is my electric ball pump um that is clutch and i've i've become kind of a ball pressure uh Oh, you're one of the snobs. I'm one of those. I'm a, oh. yeah. I've turned. I've turned into one. I know it's terrible. Oh, it's but, not uh, three point eight uh, PSI. Well, no, I just it's it's tough in in California and Florida sometimes if you have you know a really hot day and then like yeah. a cool day and you get a you get a big adjustment. But no, I I will I will I'm a I'm a ball snob to a certain to a certain extent. I have my electric ball pump to thank for that. But right. it is nice when you're when you're traveling and every you know you deflate your ball to travel and then you get there and. Corinne's over there pumping her ball up, and I'm like, just press the button, and mine's sucker. And play. yeah, <laughs> I lend it, I lend it to her. But that's a big one for me. Um, tripod is is okay. big, especially with uh, an online coach. Uh, bands, you know, just your typical warm up band. And then do you I use the I have... string. Do you use the hip bands? Do you have a uh, heavy bands like the big thick power bands, or just no? Like I one just skinny arm band and one uh, circle band. I have... Yeah, I have one circle band and one uh, just like theraband. Um, and then I have two cups that I take with me. They're the little for cupping. Yeah. Silicone, oh, silicone nice. cups. Yeah. Nice. I'm trying to think if that's, if that's it. And then ibuprofen, you know, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I'm not a big ibuprofen person, but you know, just it's in there just in case. Yeah. I agree. Uh, I'm currently living with two physical therapists and we've, we've had lots of inflammation discussions and talks and right. it's like, those are for when you need to perform or you need to get out of pain. Yeah. You know, yeah, they'll, that's... they'll break down things over time and, and they also inhibit the cellular process of inflammation, but your body needs acute inflammation for the injury repair. But if you're at the point where it's like, hey, this is the championship. I need to be here right now right. and I don't need to feel pain to hold me back. I think that's a yeah. good time for ibuprofen. But if you're like me and you were popping them like M&Ms in college and, and indoor pro, don't do that to yourself. <laughs> I, I, I used to be like, uh, I would say I, I used to take like under five or 10. I'm, I'm like under 10 a year. Oh, nice. Like that was kind of my, I, I, I've maybe taken a few more this year, but you know, mm. but yeah, just if you, if you need, I'm not, I'm not like a, oh, I feel a little bit of a little bit of pain. I'm gonna pop something. I kind of like my body to kind of feel it out, mm -hmm. to kind of understand where my baseline is. I feel like if you just keep taking ibuprofen all the time, you you lose that. Yeah, and secretly so, it just destroys the inside of your stomach. Yeah, it's not good for you. Yeah. 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 <laughs>
Yeah. No, I was, um, I was yeah. on eight a day for a while. Uh, Ooh. Which is, oh yeah. 1600, like prescription strength, self-prescribed. I was like, maybe something is wrong about this. <laughs> yeah. That's not a good place to be. That's not a good place to be. Uh, and, and lastly, are there any projects outside uh, of volleyball that you're working on right now that uh, you want people to know about, or you got kind of in the works? Um, no, not, I mean, I'm just, I, I kind of my, my brother, my um, brother-in-law and my husband are all kind of, they're building houses in North Carolina. And I help with that a little bit on the side, some remote stuff. Um, and my dad's got beach bub going on hmm. and I'm just kind of focused on, on uh, traveling. We're going to be, we might be gone for like a month and a half. So a busy year for you. Um, yeah. That's so, awesome. And then just, you know, focus good aunt. That's that's the other. All my my sister's kids, my friend's kids, and just anti skirm. Yeah, and they're gonna look at yeah. you like uh, like a superhero anyway, which is <laughs> awesome. Yeah, that's that's always cool. Yeah, my my two nieces they just just started playing volleyball, and it's oh that's so fun, super fun. And they they found out that a few of their like coaches like know who uh, who our company is and who I am, and yeah, they get like a little extra credit there. <laughs> yep. Um, yep. But it's so fun to see them picking it up and to be able to play with them. Oh, yeah, man, it's it's it cool, cool seeing little kids pick up the sport and just just be addicted to it right off the bat, where they're just yeah. running around the house, just bumping to themselves. Yeah, love it. Knocking things over, but you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah, this is why we can't have nice things. Right. Taylor Swift. <laughs> <laughs> well. Sarah, thank you so much. Uh, I know we went a little over time. I appreciate you taking the time to share your knowledge and help out oh, a bunch good. of players and do this episode. Thanks, thanks yeah. for having me. I hope I hope I was able to shed a little light on, you know, little tidbits of my volleyball life with everybody. So. Oh man, you gave so many, so many good tips for Whoops. anybody who can listen and just like pick it up right there. You know, we keep talking to our players and they're like, oh, you know, I listened to this episode on the way to practice on the way to league night and I applied it immediately. So just from your setting tips and, you know, at least your like block adjustment and communication, somebody's yeah. going to listen to this and they're going to apply it immediately and they're going to be better for it. And they're going to be happy that, that, uh, we got you on. So thank you so much. Well, for, awesome. For sharing well, that. thanks Mark for having this podcast and, you know, spreading your knowledge to everybody. Your videos are great. I, your videos pop up all the time and I think they're awesome. Like I said, my husband would watch them when he was getting into, when he first kind of started playing, I would tell him things doesn't always want to hear them from me but then you would say it on your reel and i would just be like here's mark mark said it he's and then and then you know he goes and does it so nice. i appreciate it too happy to subversively coach your husband for you <laughs> thank you <laughs> awesome thanks for coming on and uh we'll see you on the sand appreciate it <laughs>